uh, would be document number 2015 HLPDAB slash 003. Uh, this is the topic on the overview of the status and impact of crop biotech adaptation laws the biotech advisory team of the Department of Agriculture. Ma'am, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, let's look at what's happening on biotech crop adop adoption in the Asia Pacific. Okay, so we'll talk about world production of biotech crops, the globally produced and newly approved biotech crops, um, what uh, our members are producing, the regulation of biotech crops in APEC economies, the impacts of biotech crops, uh, a mention of some of the selected future biotech crops, and the regulatory implication of new techniques in agricultural biotechnology. Uh, what we see here is a continuing growth in the area for biotech crops. Uh, as of 2014, there are 28 biotech uh, economies. These are economies that are planting biotech crops. And the total hectare is uh, 181.5 million hectares uh, being planted by 18 million farmers. So that uh, this represents a sustained increase of 3 to 4 percent, or 6.3 million hectares per year. Uh, yeah, this is the famous slide that has been shown. This, I think this is the third time that you're going to show this today. This is just to show where the uh, countries are and uh, how much each country is planting. So these are the, bio, the globally produced biotech crops. We have alfalfa and the traits. We have uh, herbicide tolerance, less lignin alfalfa. We have eggplant, insect resistant, canola, high herbicide tolerant, and also modified fatty acid content. We have cotton, insect resistant, uh, herbicide tolerant. Maize has lots of traits. We have insect resistance, herbicide tolerance, drought tolerance. Um, modified starts, you have, uh, then you have a modified ami alpha amylase and high lysine. And then you have uh, virus resistant papaya, you have insect resistant poplar, we have uh, modified start potato, we have virus resistant squash, soybean high, high herbicide tolerance, uh, insect resistance, modified fatty acid, and sugar beet. Uh, which is herbicide tolerant, sweet pepper is virus resistant, and so is the tomato. And then you have also rose and carnation. Uh, different, the different shades of the blue rose and the uh, blue carnation. Uh, we have newly approved crops for commercialization. You have uh, alfalfa with multiple herbicide uh, tolerance uh, trait. You have the less browning apple, virus resistant uh, bean, we have potato that is less browning, also it produces less acrylamide, which is a, a serious health concern. And then you have multiple herbicide tolerant soybean, and we have the drought tolerant uh, sugarcane from Indonesia. Well, just a, back, uh, just a backdrop to that, that, that means again that, you know, uh, the discussion among the economists about and also this morning about uh, LLP would be very significant in here. Okay, the APEC economies that are producing biotech crops are, U.S. is still number one, which uh, has a big area of 73 million hectares, and we have the uh, maize, soybean, cotton, canola, sugar beet, alfalfa, papaya, squash are planted there. Canada comes in uh, second, poor second, compared with USA. They have four crops, canola, maize, soybean, sugar beet. China has 3.9 million hectares of cotton, papaya, poplar, tomato, and sweet pepper. The Philippines will have only one crop, uh, 800,000 uh, hectares of maize. Australia has 0.5. Uh, million hectares of cotton, canola, and carnation. 
and rose. Mexico has 200,000 hectares of cotton and soybean. Chile has less than 0 0.05 million hectares of maize, soybean. This is mostly for seed production. So we have a total of seven economies with a total of 90.15 million hectares, which is about 50% of the area that is globally planted to GM crop. Uh, we're hoping Vietnam and Indonesia is going to join the list, uh, the list this year because they have approved uh, crops also in their own economies. We have differing regulatory policies on biotech crops in, among us. Um, here I have looked at the study done. Uh, this is uh, done by Dr. Carino and Dr. Salinger under the USAID project. And uh, we have, you know, the regulatory policies are different. We have a complete regulatory system from confined research field trials to commercial production. And we have these economies that already have this in place. You have Australia, Canada, China, Hong Kong, China, Chile, Japan, Korea, Indonesia, Mexico, the Philippines, Singapore, Vietnam, and the United States. Now for Malaysia, Chinese Taipei, and Thailand, they have regulatory policies in place only for confined research and field trials. For Peru and the Russian Federation, they have regulatory policies for confined research. Uh, pa Brunei Darussalam and Papua New Guinea do not have a specific regulation, although Papua New Guinea has, uh, is developing one. Now, the import for direct use, there's already regulatory policy in more countries. You have Australia, Canada, China, Chinese Taipei, Chile, Hong Kong, China, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, Peru, the Philippines, Korea, Singapore, the Russian Federation, Thailand. But it is only, for Thailand, it is only soya and corn. Uh, you'll have to correct me for that later if you wish, and then Vietnam and the United States. We also see some moratorium or ban on production. In Australia, five states have, all, have a ban on production. Peru, Thailand, and Hawaii in the U.S. have bans on production. Then on labeling, we have la mandatory labeling in Australia. In Canada, it is only mandatory if there is a safety issue. And then you have uh, China, Japan, New Zealand, Korea, Malaysia, Mexico, and Chinese Taipei. And what you're going to see also is there are differences in the threshold for labeling. We also have lab uh, voluntary labeling in Canada if there is no safety issue, as well as in Hong Kong, China. Now, as to the economic impact, this is a study done by Brooks and Barfoot in 2011, and also local in the Philippines by Manalo and Ramon. And uh, the global net economic gains, this is the actual additional income gain. This would be about 116.6 billion US dollars for 17 years from 1996 to 2012. And uh, this is shared 50-50 by farmers in developing countries and farmers in developed countries. And uh, modern biotech crop commodities are cheaper by about 20% compared with their non-traditional or non-transgenic counterpart, if available. We have, as, as of 2014, 18 million farmers planting modern biotech crops, of which 91.7% or 16.5 million are previously resource poor farmers. And the uh, global average for the increases in crop yields is about 22%. And the global average for increases in farmers' profits is about 68%. And if you're going to visit its country, what you're going to see is that this is a uh, measure for alleviating poverty. In the Philippines, uh, this is what we have. 
The average yield, ad yield advantage of biotech corn over ordinary hybrid corn is 19%. The income advantage in farming biotech corn over ordinary hybrid corn is 8%. And the return on investment over ordinary hybrid corn of biotech corn is higher by 42%. As of 2014, more than 400,000 Filipino corn farmers has planted biotech corn, and they started out mostly as resource poor. Uh, this is uh, a later study, you know, 2013 study actually, showing how our corn farmers are spending the income from biotech corn. Uh, you have the day-to-day -day expense, 78.7 uh, of them says that's where they put their income, so that, you know, they spend it locally, it fuels the rural economy. And then 60.9% spend the, the income also on children's education. In the Philippines, this means sending your child to the university. 60.9% of them uh, do that. 46% uh, of them would spend the in additional income on home improvements, 23% on farm capital, 3.7% can buy their vehicles and some even go to Hong Kong, you know, for leisure, okay? So 0.5% of the respondents said they now have time, they can now spend for leisure and recreation. So if you really look at this, what it means is that those who can already send their children to the university means they're already out of poverty. So that's 60.9%. And if, the, if you apply that to the more than 400,000 biotech corn farmers, that's, uh, you know, that's a big number. Although probably some of them did not really start out as poor as the rest. But if you go around our country, that's what you're going to hear. I, I just came from one region on the Philippines and everybody there, we, I attended a, biotech, a corn congress. Everybody in that uh, meeting are actually biotech corn, corn, uh, corn farmers because they can now afford to, be, to attend meetings also. Okay, environmental impacts has also been studied and uh, the planting, the extensive planting of biotech crops help mitigate climate change with permanent savings in carbon dioxide emission. This is through the, the reduced use of fossil based fuels because of the fewer insecticide and herbicide sprays. In 2013, the estimated savings is about 2.1 billion kilos of carbon dioxide. And this is equivalent of reducing the number of cars in the road by 0.93 million or 933,000 cars out of the road annually. Okay, the additional soil carbon sequestration from conservation tillage is estimated in 2013 as uh, 25.9 billion kilos of carbon dioxide. So, you know, the savings, the carbon emission saved by conservation tillage is actually larger than that from the reduction of use of fossil-based fuels. This is 25.9 billion kilos of carbon dioxide sequestered or it was not released in the environment. And this is equivalent of removing 11.5 million cars from the road in one year. Well, you know, uh, the agriculture, con the conventional agriculture does have an environmental footprint. And what the planting of uh, biotech crops do is to reduce this environmental footprint. Now we have two traits that are extensively, that are in the extensively planted crops. You have insect resistance and herbicide tolerance and the reduction in pesticide use from 1996 to 2012 is estimated as about 500 million kilos of active ingredient which represents a saving of 8.7% in pesticide usage. 
as uh, I explained earlier, there's also savings on fossil fuels. You have reduction in carbon emissions through uh, zero or uh, minimal cultivation. And also when you have minimal uh, tillage, you conserve the soil and, uh, soil and moisture. Drought tolerance, which is one of the uh, new traits that's, uh, that is being introduced, will conserve water through efficient usage of water. It's also claimed that uh, the planting, extensive planting of uh, biotech crops would save biodiversity through increased productivity. The increased productivity from biotech crops is equivalent to a savings of 132 million hectares of natural ecosystems from conversion to agriculture. What it means is that if we could have cultivated these crops, getting that amount of production, then we could we could we should have had uh, what's this? We should we should have had cultivated or. Uh, converted uh, natural 132 million hectares of natural ecosystems into agriculture. But because of the, because we can get this increased productivity, then we don't have to do that. So in, uh, the number one reason for losing biodiversity actually is the conversion of natural ecosystems to agriculture. So this is one method of preventing that. And Biotech crops would support the continued intensification of agricultural productivity. It is sustainable because it is environment friendly and also farmer friendly because it increases their incomes. In the Philippines, what has been seen by our uh, local researcher is that the land use efficiency is 15% that means, uh, yeah, what it means actually, let me just restate that, is to produce one metric ton of biotech corn, you need 15% less land compared with non-biotech corn. Sorry, that's a wrong one. Okay, and the fertilizer use efficiency, uh, farmers uh, find that uh, the biotech corn would uh, use the fertilizers, 9%, that is, they yield more, you know, by 9% with the same amount of fertilizer placed on non-biotech corn. And the lab labor use efficiency, biotech corn farmers are more efficient by 26% in the use of labor than non-biotech corn because of the increasing productivity, you know. You, you, you invest the same amount of labor, but you're going to get higher yields and therefore that, uh, rep that uh, explains that efficiency. And pesticide use efficiency, 54% less pesticide use with biotech corn compared with non-biotech corn. <coughs> I have looked through the literature and the reports of approved crops and these are the ones that are, uh, that looks like they, may, they might come soon. Golden rice, this bacterial uh, wilt resistant banana in Uganda, virus resistant cassava also in Africa, late blight resistant potato is sometimes approved, it is sometimes withdrawn. So, but I think Indonesia is working on this. Then you have high yielding wheat, high beta carotene banana, aphid repelling wheat, delayed ripening papaya, less browning apples, as I have seen earlier, is already approved. There are, we are expecting new corn, from the private sector, we're expecting new corn events with drought tolerance and increased or increased water use efficiency, high yield, new insect tolerance, new herbicide tolerance, nitrogen use efficient, and higher ethanol yield traits. New canola events with herbicide tolerance, new herbicide tolerance, high yield, healthy fatty acid content, and high oil quality. And new soybean events with drought tolerance, high yield, new insect tolerance, new herbicide tolerance, and high stearate 
and increased oil content. Also, in the laboratories, in various, in various economies, there are new breeding techniques that are already being used. And uh, this, some of these are really intended to reduce the regulatory cost because the regulatory cost is about 25% in biotech crop development. That is in a study by Crop Life Inter International in 2011 that, that represents about 35.1 million uh, US dollars in uh, complying with regulation. Okay, what are these new breeding techniques? We have enzyme-mediated mutation breeding. Now I'm going back to the conventional terms actually in plant breeding, okay? Because uh, many of these techniques are actually improvements on conventional breeding methods. That's why I say, Enzyme-mediated mutation breeding is the use of designer DNA enzyme systems to change specific genes in the genome. They even refer to this as genome editing. It's a new term for something, you know, that is being done before, but it, in a more precise way. So you have CRISPR, Talen, um, zinc finger nucleases, and oligonucleotide-directed mutagenesis. Okay. Another is, again, RDNA-mediated wide hybridization. What, the, what does this mean? Well, because the genes are sourced from related species, and we have been doing hi wide hybridization for quite some time, you know, but in this case, again, you have a more precise method of doing wide hybridization. Okay. Then we have the transgenics with new, no foreign new foreign or new protein product. This is the RNAi technology, and uh, terms that are used for this are also gene silencing. The code protein technology turns out to be an RNAi technology. The anti-sense technology is also an RNAi technology. But we have understood this, uh, the mechanisms for uh, RNAi and uh, there are newer applications for this technology. So you have the virus-resistant papaya is a product of the coat protein technology. We also have conventional breeding mediated by transgenic parents. The final products are non-transgenic progenies. So you have reverse breeding, transgene-induced epigenetics, the SPT, which is a which is uh, developed by Pioneer Hybrid. And then you also have the early maturing transgenic parents. Another is grafting on transgenic rootstock. So you have, again, a non-transgenic produce. We also have whole plant transformation systems like agrofiltration, agroinoculation, flora dips, which may or may not result in a transgene. So, yeah, before I close, I would just like to say that this would have implications in our regulatory systems. For those of us who have not considered these systems, uh, it's about time for us to review and see how we are going to uh, deal with these new uh, regulatory systems. Okay? So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Halos. Thank you very much for a sharing with us that uh, collection of very useful information and numbers. Uh, we have time for uh, a couple or so clarificatory questions or interventions or comments. Members? Or if you're still ruminating on those uh, very exotic technical terms, we probably can uh, come back so we can uh, proceed with uh, our next presentation. If we have, uh, if we have adequate more time or adequate time after all the presentations, we can actually come back to uh, questions and members can propound any question at any particular time as, as they wish. Okay, uh, thank you very much. May I then please uh, 
uh, direct the attention of members and participants on agenda item uh, number eight. This is a report on the outcomes of the workshop on fostering the benefits of innovations in plant breeding and science communication. This is uh, document number uh, 2015 slash HLPDAB slash 004. And may I please call on and invite Dr. Randy Hautea of the International of Ag Biotech Applications. Dr. Hautea, you have the floor, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, everyone. I will be uh, reporting on the uh, outcomes of uh, a workshop uh, uh, held last uh, June uh, 2015 on uh, fostering the benefits of innovation uh, in plant breeding and uh, science uh, communication. So I'll be doing the uh, reporting on behalf of the uh, co-organizers of this uh, 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 workshop. Uh, I became the default presenter for <laughs> for today, and I, I hope I'll do justice to the to the uh, uh, to the report. I have a few slides uh, to uh, uh, summarize the uh, outcome of these uh, uh, workshops, and uh, I organize them in uh, in the in the following uh, 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 order. A little bit about the background uh, on the workshop and its uh, uh, objectives, and then uh, going to the highlights, which are the uh, summary points on the, uh, the two major uh, topics of the, of the workshop, uh, fostering the benefits of innovation in, in plant breeding, and the highlights of the uh, science communication uh, workshop, and end up with uh, uh, some action items that the uh, uh, participants have uh, uh, identified. This uh, uh, workshop uh, was uh, proposed and uh, uh, sponsored by four uh, uh, economists, and that's the U.S., uh, Philippines, uh, Mexico, and uh, Singapore. It was held in uh, 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 Alabang, Montilupa City in uh, Metro Manila uh, from uh, the 8th to the 12th of uh, June uh, in 2015. It was uh, structured to be a two-part uh, uh, workshop. Uh, first two days uh, focused on uh, new innovations in uh, plant breeding. Uh, the, the last two days uh, focused on uh, uh, science communication. And uh, in between the two parts was a one-day uh, study visit to the International uh, Rice Research uh, Institute that allowed participants the opportunity to look at the science that ILI uh, was doing, uh, including uh, applications of the, of the new uh, innovations. So the workshop had uh, uh, 33 uh, resource persons uh, altogether. It was organized and funded by USDA, the US uh, uh, Atari, uh, which is a USAID uh, funded uh, uh, project, uh, ISA, and uh, importantly by the Philippine Department of uh, Agriculture under the uh, Philippine Agricultural and Fisheries uh, Biotechnology uh, Program. It was a well-attended workshop of uh, 139 participants from uh, 17 uh, APEC uh, member economies participating, uh, three non-APEC uh, economies. Uh, which included one uh, observer economy and uh, also invited guests from the uh, uh, private uh, sector. And as I mentioned earlier, the Philippines served as the host uh, uh, economy of this, uh, of this workshop. Uh, just a few uh, slides uh, that were taken during the five-day uh, uh, event. So overall, the uh, objectives of the uh, uh, workshop is to again uh, uh, help enhance the uh, uh, 
uh, scientific knowledge of uh, uh, APIC uh, uh, economy regulators and uh, uh, policy makers, uh, especially in the new uh, uh, innovations. Uh, enhance the understanding and the benefits of uh, new plant breeding uh, techniques. Uh, discuss how current government policies and regulations can promote innovative plant breeding and how to assist the uh, APIC economies in undertaking appropriate uh, risk management practices and emerging uh, technologies. Further, to discuss the suitability and the applicability of uh, present risk assessment guidelines for products of new breeding techniques subject to regulation, and improve science communication among APIC economy officials uh, to more effectively communicate new technology issues and nurture the public's confidence in new technologies and regulatory uh, systems. Let me now go to the uh, uh, summary points uh, of the uh, first part of that uh, uh, workshop which is on new innovations in uh, uh, plant breeding. The economic, environmental, and social needs and benefits for new innovative technologies uh, in plant breeding uh, exist uh, uh, right now. Uh, the challenge is how to harness these new uh, technologies to help address uh, food security and climate change uh, uh, challenges. Getting innovation from conception to development to deployment is uh, paramount uh, to meet uh, uh, these needs. Transparent science-based regulations and consumers' confidence in the regulations are a must. If we are to advance the science and reap the benefits of agricultural innovation, Regulations must also be predictable to empower public and private sector scientists to develop and commercialize new improved uh, plant and animal uh, varieties. Innovative technologies are significantly increasing the efficiency and precision of plant breeding and are additional tools in the breeder's uh, uh, toolbox. Many of these technologies generate products that are no different from products that could be obtained by traditional breeding methods. Therefore, if we want to encourage agricultural innovation to meet the increasing demands of APEC economies uh, and the world uh, at large, we need to enable uh, innovative technologies by science-based and appropriate decisions consistently with products from traditional breeding methods. Deployment of and benefits from such innovative technologies will be largely reduced if their products will incur regulatory burden similar to that established for GMOs in many APEC economies. Trade is a huge benefit to APIC economies and a large source of income for APIC region farmers. The value of a harmonization of regulations and trade policies among APIC economies would increase uh, trade. Going now uh, to the summary points on the science communication uh, part of the of the workshop, and these are the uh, summary uh, uh, points uh, coming out of that uh, 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 two-day workshop. APIC member economies reaffirm the importance of public engagement in the decision-making process, consistent with domestic laws and obligations. We note our current processes and collective efforts to provide for meeting obligations 
related to transparency and public participation, such as public uh, consultations. We believe that the role of uh, regulatory agencies should be to commit to ensuring functioning, transparent, and science-based processes to facilitate public understanding about the regulatory process and to otherwise be neutral and not seek to persuade the public or undertake advocacy in terms of influencing the marketplace. We recognize our common experiences regarding the challenges to science-based decision-making posed by advocacy campaigns aimed against uh, these technologies. We note the challenge of public perceptions about safety, and in particular, how on one hand, economies are obligated to demonstrate evidence to support decisions about safety, whereas advocacy groups, on the other hand, can disseminate safety claims and not necessarily have accountability uh, for those uh, uh, claims. We reaffirm the fundamental importance of science in our economies, uh, particularly as regards to our strategic policy statements and plans to harness scientific knowledge to help address challenges to the sustainability of agriculture and our agri-food uh, system, in addition to fostering our respective domestic efforts at sustainable economic development via investment in innovations and to inclusive development and helping smallholder, smallholder farmers. We believe that science communication is one tool for helping address a gap and a trend of increasing concern in which effective innovation is developed but not deployed. This concern applies particularly to public sector research and humanitarian products. And finally, looking at uh, some uh, action uh, items, the uh, economies uh, should continue to share uh, information, uh, practices, resources, uh, lessons uh, learned uh, on new innovative technologies and uh, science uh, uh, communications. We should continue to consider our collective efforts and interests related to science communication, including future APIC workshops and coordination for relevant meetings of international organizations, especially as regards public sector uh, research. Economies should identify opportunities to learn about and collectively engage in the, in the latest efforts in science uh, uh, communication, including uh, coalition building among scientists, uh, media journalists, farmers, consumers, uh, other experts and stakeholders in a whole of community uh, efforts. The economy should learn about the latest developments and strategies for 20, 21st century science and low risk communication including compelling narratives and trust-based uh, communications, and new modalities such as social marketing and investment in pre-crisis uh, credibility. And finally, uh, economists should train science communicators as full-time professionals, uh, avoid ad hoc efforts, undertake strategic communications proactively to better manage messages. And economies should build and make available to the APEC members a list of experts on biosafety, risk assessment, and science communication for reference and information inquiry as needed. Let me end by just acknowledging the uh, uh, parties who uh, made significant contributions in the conduct of this workshop. Uh, Stacy Pekins from uh, USDA, uh, Pesach Lovinsky, uh, Tony Alfonso, 
dispersely uh, Jana Idros, more especially the DABPL staff, and our colleagues uh, in, in ISA. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, report, uh, Dr. Haltea. Uh, we have a couple or so opportunities for, uh, although this is a report of an activity uh, held under the uh, ambit of uh, our, uh, of this meeting, and uh, that's, it is being reported here. We may have uh, some particular comments or any interventions or further contributions uh, to this uh, very important report. The United States, please. Uh, yes, yeah, so just on, on behalf of the U.S., I wanted to thank uh, ISAAA's Randy Hautea uh, and the Philippine hosts in particular, uh, Dr. Serrano, our distinguished chair, and the Department of Agriculture, who did a f fantastic job in facilitating this workshop. Uh, also wanted to give additional thanks to uh, U.S. APEC Technical Assistance for the Advance of Regional Integration, also called U.S. Atari, and the U.S. Agency for International Development, and the APEC Secretariat, uh, particularly Yasmin Amin and Mr. Pruthavong, uh, and uh, also Nathan and Associates Inc. Uh, this was a collaborative effort. It was a tremendously successful event, and it really required a lot of uh, different folks pulling together to, to do such a great job. Thank you again. Thank you, U.S. Any further contributions? Okay, uh, indeed, uh, let me reiterate uh, our thanks to our presenter and uh, emphasizing the importance of uh, communication in science and technology development as well as its uh, spread and the need to uh, coordinate and communicate among ourselves, especially among the member economies of APEC. May I please now uh, invite the attention of everybody to agenda item number nine. Okay, this is, uh, we don't have a document reference for this uh, report. This is a, an open press report because this is a report on the uh, private sector initiated activity this morning that we all, I think most of us have attended. Uh, and this is a forum on the Global Alliance for Ag Biotech Trade. Uh, model policy on low-level presence and GM and organic farming coexistence. Uh, this is a mere report of the event uh, that has been actively participated in by our uh, private sector partners. And this will be reported to us by Ms. Sunny Tababa of RepLife Asia. Sunny, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, we would like to thank APEC, the member economies, the APEC Secretariat, and the Philippine Department of Agriculture, the Philippine government in general, for continuing to engage the private sector under the APEC high-level policy dialogue on agricultural biotechnology. This morning's private sector day have been participated by different private sector representatives, not only from the technology developers, but also from the far farming, farming group and also the grain trade uh, uh, sector. And we will be hearing that after my, my report. So this activity just happened this morning. So let's see if many of you can remember. I see many young faces. So memory recall would be very good. So this morning, we have four speakers. One talk about general issues concerning coexistence of GM crops and organic farming. It's like a helicopter view of this uh, issue, and it's becoming a very important issue as far as agricultural biotechnology is concerned. And we are very happy that there's another presentation about this, which could really give us more time to have conversations about this issue. We also have the uh, 
discussion on uh, low-level presence, and this time the Global Alliance for Ag Biotech Trade, which is also very appreciative of this space under the Private Sector Day, talk about a industry uh, policy model. And that's something I could discuss later. And there was discussion about how important this new technology coming, which we call the BT eggplant, but still struggling to come out. So um, we have some key, key takeaways for uh, the first uh, topic that we discussed this morning about GM and organic farming coexistence. And let me see if you have, if you agree, but we, what we remember is that there are different agriculture production systems and coexistence talk about having a balanced approach towards this, accommodating the needs of the farmers, and also looking at how market uh, accepts these different uh, production technologies. And we, we heard about the different models that have been in place by different countries in terms of how they work towards addressing coexistence, and we've heard the Chile model uh, in very brief way in the US, in the EU, and probably others, there are other approaches that they have taken to make sure that this issue is addressed. We have heard a lot of discussion saying that it becomes really a problematic to either uh, whether you plant conventional biotech crops or organic, cro or, or organic crops when certain standards like the organic market standards does not accommodate tolerance or has, is having a zero tolerance uh, threshold. And we've seen this as an example in Australia where farmers are not supposed to be fighting, but they're fighting about this. So we have seen that. And we have also very briefly uh, heard about some stewardship practices that can uh, address issues on coexistence. And finally, um, it, when you market organic products, there are certifications. And we heard that there are different certification uh, processes that are existing in different geographies and probably the next speaker would be able to elaborate more on this. My favorite topic, <laughs> the Gabit, uh, we have Stefan here who spoke about uh, the organization. It's really a coalition of different uh, groups from the producer, supply chain, and uh, technology developers. And we heard about how uh, practical solutions to what we call the low-level presence of ag biotech commodities, which are approved on certain in one country, but is not yet approved in the importing market, importing country. And we've seen this, we have issues in terms of how these are dealt when these commodities are imported for food, feed, and processing. So remember that low-level presence has already is about biotech commodities that have at least uh, one approval from the originating country and also it is for food feed and processing. And we've seen that, uh, we heard that some of the solutions to this, there, there have been discussions about low level presence in the past, private sector day under APEC and when I started uh, to join Crop Life Asia, my first uh, my first opening salvo to APEC was in 2009, and that that this discussion on low level presence have been going on until to this day. But things are moving on, and so we've heard that there are practical solutions that must realize the principles like the science base, which is actually how risk assessments are being done, and it should be proportionate to risk. And just to note that LLP solutions that the industry is proposing is really temporary. Everyone, the technology developers, have to obtain uh, full approval for the events that are imported. Another one that was discussed uh, this morning was that this information should be publicly uh, available 
the commercial status and the bio biotech regulatory status of these events so that there could be transparency and then governments will be uh, assisted in facilitating the risk review process or risk management process. And we have discussed FAO, uh, possible uh, this database at the FAO. And meantime, while it's still being discussed as to how it's going to be operated on all the associated uh, issues of having a, uh, a website for that, there are websites that are available to help governments. We have, of course, the Biosafety Clearing House under the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. And then we have the Biosafety websites of all governments. These are part of their obligations being party to Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety to put in place in their own respective websites, the approvals, and the regulatory status of all these biotech events. The industry as well have, are commit, is committed to, uh, to be part of this undertaking of making information available. And we have what we call the biotech trade status. This is a website under the bio uh, organization. And this is where you can get up-to-date information where a technology developer gets approval from which country it is right away uh, inputted in the website. So it's very, very recent, updated. And I think we talk about how important it is to work together, governments, whether it's the exporting government or the importing government, we have to work together in resolving issues that have something to do with LLP. And basically the bottom line is we respect and we must ensure that regulatory approvals will be granted to all these uh, LLP uh, events when we come up with a LLP situation. Now, there is an, a standing commitment from technology developers that even when biosafety approvals have been granted for environment or, or food feed approval, um, we, we hold on to that we, we only pursue commercial launch once we get approval from major importing markets so that we can lessen the situation where uh, LLP occurs. And that's why we are engaging APEC and other international platforms so that there could be an international policy that can be worked out within this discussion among governments or member economies so that we will have, an, a, instead of going government to government or working with its geography, then an international platform where there is agreement would really facilitate and uh, facilitate trade among the countries. So we were talking about uh, a market, a, a threshold of uh, five percent, and basically there was a lot of discussion why it was five percent, and then. Uh, and a lot of uh, other uh, questions related to how you're going to implement that one. And so there were three situations. Did you remember that there were three situations? Okay, so there were three situations. But what you see in the screen is one situation where really there is an LLP situation and this is where we believe that uh, industry is proposing uh, that a regulatory to say will be submitted once that LLP situation occurs, a dossier will be submitted within 60 days. And while that is uh, being under evaluation, then the 5% tre threshold kicks in. And if the dossier is not submitted within that duration, uh, there will be uh, gov governments or the importing uh, countries have to uh, do something about it because clearly that is already out of compliance. Uh, monitoring the progress of this discussion, this is actually a more, uh, com more comprehensive proposal from industry. Uh, we've heard about two speakers to c talking about BT eggplant and we, we, it is an example of a public-private partnership because we have private sector working on uh, donating the 
the gene part, and then the public sector across three uh, geographies, Philippines, uh, Bangladesh, and, and India, uh, developing varieties that are suitable to their uh, respective agroecosystems. And we heard how this technology, the BT eggplant, in, in uh, the potential of it, once it gets into the farmer's hands, how it would help farmers improve their livelihood, how it would give them better protection in terms of health, and how it could be safer to the environment. However, uh, we have also heard that there are several um, constraints to that, and the uh, farmer uh, speaker, Mr. Paraluman, have really uh, shared with us the challenges in terms of winning the hearts of those who are opposing the technology. And though they're leading in the fight towards endorsing this technology, and while they have completed the local developers, public sector developer, completed until the multi-location trials, it's really a question now of when will the farmers start getting their hands on the BT egg plant. So we're hoping that the uh, Philippine government would be, would be able to resolve some issues associated with it, and our farmers could really be helped. And uh, just like the Bangladesh farmers, and I think if I, my memory, okay, so that's the end of the report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Sunny, for this uh, very nice report. Uh, uh, maybe you can also formalize it later so we can put it in the documentation. Uh, may I just say, of course, that when you said the Philippine government couldn't resolve the issues, and as far as the Department of Agriculture are concerned, the issues are resolved and we are now in the other branch of government that needs to resolve certain legal issues. Well, uh, I, I would probably represent uh, the sentiment of members in taking note of this uh, and express our, uh, our gratitude for sharing with this meeting the results and the highlights uh, of the meeting. And uh, we hope that this kind of a practice of uh, partnership with the private sector and this kind of an engagement uh, with governments of uh, APEC member, member, member economies would, would continue and it's a practice that we have, uh, we have had uh, for, for some time and with very full results and uh, with uh, particular information and suggestions from our private sector partners filtering into uh, as taken noted, but noted of by our, uh, by our members. But uh, may I please open the floor for any uh, further contributions on on this report of uh, uh, crop life, on the results and the highlights of the meeting with the private sector uh, this morning. The floor is open. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Sunny, for this uh, report. Uh, as I've said, we, we do take note of, uh, and thank you for uh, reporting to this meeting, the highlights of the private sector initiated activity this morning. May I now please uh, invite the attention of members and participants to uh, agenda item number 10, uh, which we can reference with document number 2015 slash HLP DAB 005. And these are policy considerations and current practices on coexistence of agricultural production systems, conventional, organic, and GM crops. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Geoff Honey, our resource person from Grain Trade Australia. With honey and grain, I think there is not much you can ask for more. Sir, you have the floor. Uh, and just to add to that, I'll also keep bees, if you can believe it, in the backyard. 
Um, thanks very much, Mr. Chairman, and, uh, and a special thanks to the APEC Secretariat and to the Department of Agriculture in the Philippines who off, you know, uh, extended the invitation uh, to speak here today. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's quite an honour. Um, it's something that I haven't done before, so uh, I am looking forward to it. Just before I do start, though, just a couple of thoughts, if you like. Um, over the next uh, 15, 20, 25 minutes, the world population will increase on a net basis by about 25, 30,000 people to seven point, just under 7.4 billion people. The amount of arable land that we have in the world, uh, and I'm speaking particularly from a grain perspective, is pretty limited. If I was to say from an Australian perspective, uh, it's a given. We're not gonna see any more arable land for grain production in Australia open up. Uh, if I was to say anything at all, we could even see a reduction. Uh, I think uh, as a nation we probably overstepped the bounds in terms of the amount of uh, land that we did open up, particularly on the edges of the wheat growing areas. The other thing that we need to put into the mix is climate change. Um, I'm not a scientist, um, but there's a couple of things that I do know, and particularly from an Australian perspective, over the last hundred years, the climate in the uh, um, wheat growing or the grain growing regions of Australia have increased between one and one and a half percent and there's been a corresponding decrease in rainfall. The grain growing regions of Australia are getting hotter and drier. Um, and what are we doing as a nation? Uh, what are we doing as a grains industry uh, about that particular uh, situation? Um, and I'd also just sort of put in there, I just sort of noticed on this, new, this morning's uh, wires that the governor of the uh, Bank of England just came out last night and said climate change is the biggest challenge facing us and uh, he's in pretty good company along with Ban Ki-moon, uh, the Secretary General of the UN. So look, I just wanted to put those there. So we've got some really, as, as a global, and I'm talking from a grain perspective, a grain trade perspective, uh, as a global industry, uh, we've got some real challenges, um, and so I'd sort of summarise all of those in two dot points. Food security um, for on a global basis, so we just can't look at Australia and say, okay, from an Australian perspective, we're fine, because we export two-thirds of what we produce. That's a pretty selfish sort of attitude. Uh, the other thing is protection and enhancement of our current natural resources, uh, and I sort of stress there protection and enhancement. Um, so we need to do something about that and, I, and I'd put it to you that that's a shared responsibility, not just uh, within an, uh, a particular jurisdiction but on a global basis. Um, so there isn't a slide on this, um, but just a little bit on Grain Trade Australia, 32nd um, potted history. Uh, we are a trade association, we are not part of government in any way, shape or form. We're totally funded by industry. Uh, uh, we, had, we do have a website um, and, uh, uh, and our membership and where we derive our funding from is from the grain trade uh, within Australia. So it's pretty predictive in terms of uh, the name and, and where it comes from. And the other thing that I should say is that the presentation that actually is in your pack was a draft. So look, I'd just like if I could just ask the chair to make uh, the presentation that I will be given uh, available to you. Okay, so just a couple of things there. I'll just sort of uh, whiz through the two, two uh, ones up the front, the food security, challenges for the global grain trade, and I'll cover off on things such as low-level presence. It's absolutely critical because uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a price risk matrix there. Uh, coexistence, what the Australian experience has been, and then just some closing remarks. Um, just food security is, is a, it's a global issue. Um, once again, the North American, uh, South American, uh, Australia, like we're all in terms of, uh, in terms of particularly from a grain perspective, we're all in good shape, uh, but there's areas of deficit. So it's all about moving grain from those areas of uh, surplus to areas of deficit. But uh, keeping in mind that this is being moved, it's not being moved government to government, it's being moved by com companies uh, w who are taking a position in the market and moving that, and so they incur substantial risks. Uh, and what they are looking for is some sort of certainty on a whole range of issues, 
and none the least is GM regulation. Global production, um, I'm sure this has been, this type of uh, slide has been put to you many times. Uh, currently, we're looking at uh, world production around about two and a half billion tonnes, uh, of which about 300 million tonnes uh, goes into the global trade each year. 300 million tonnes of uh, uh, grain moving around the world. Uh, but the important point there is by 2050, the, the, uh, we're going to require about four billion tonnes of uh, grain, of which one and a half billion uh, is going to have to uh, um, move from the world's bread baskets and other areas to areas of need. Okay, so there's ex estimated 600 million, uh, or about 15% of total production will be transferred. Okay, so it's a it's a real challenge in front of us. Just to give you some idea, and uh, I just picked Philippines and wheat. Um, uh, the Philippines, for instance, this is the other thing to consider when you're looking at regulation and uh, putting protocols and policies in place. Wheat just doesn't, in, in, the, in this particular case, I could have used soya beans, I could have used corn into China, I couldn't, I just picked wheat into, uh, into the Philippines. Uh, the Philippines uh, derives its wheat from three major sources, uh, Canada, the United States and Australia. Um, so it's coming from multiple origins. So the, the, the rules or the policies that are in, in place have to be suitable for all those different origins and, and varieties of wheat. It's not just a simple one country supplies, one, one market. So the policies have to suit multiple origins for, uh, for the grain. And once again, just want to put this one in, just to highlight what, where the, the trend is. So there's increasing hectares, but also increasing numbers of new GM events that are coming onto the market. So one, the, the, the issue there is with new GM events that are coming onto the market, we need to have the regulatory processes in place to be able to commercially um, uh, put those events onto the market, but also for the grain trade um, to be able to, to trade those events with a high degree of commercial confidence. If commercial confidence doesn't exist, there's only one thing that will occur, and that will be people will either do one of two things, if, you know, this is if commercial confidence is not there, they will either withdraw from the market or put a price premium on trading into a particular market. If that is to occur, um, prices go up. So just a quick one on the Australian grain, and this would be similar to any export market that uh, uh, is in existence. You've got production, um, and uh, that's just, you know, sort of photos of an Australian farm. The thing I want to emphasise there is that's probably a paddock of wheat in the, top, uh, in, the, in the top left. That particular farm probably also grows wheat, barley and canola. The same machinery is used to harvest the wheat, barley and canola, and the same trucks are used to take it to storage sites uh, in, in, uh, um, in uh, major centres. And then likewise with whether it's going road or rail, the road trucks, the rail wagons, etc., are the same ones, and they, exp and they are used for wheat, barley, canola, a variety of commodities. Going into export terminals, that export terminal might be exporting wheat this week, might be exporting barley the following week. And then if the other thing that we do have in there is the number of players along the, su along the supply chain. Um, and uh, in Australia's case, we've got about 25,000 growers. By the time it gets to export, we've got 17 export terminals. So you've, you're seeing a large number of, uh, well, a huge increase uh, in, in tonnage, and that's the next one. So the, the tonnes increase the further down the supply chain you go. And the biggest thing there is, and I th think I did hear this, was the commingling of the grain as it goes down the supply chain. There is no way that you can have a shipment of wheat that is 100% wheat. There will be a small amount, trace amounts of barley in that, in the case of Australia, of barley in that shipment. If you look hard enough, if you look long enough, you will find something that is not wheat. And that is just, that is, that is just a given. And we cover that off we have thresholds in all of our standards. And I'm not just talking Australia here, whether it's the USDA, the, the Canada Grains, uh, sorry, the Canada Grains Commission that releases the standards in Canada. Um, standards always have thresholds 
for things other than the particular commodity that is being traded. If that was not to occur, trade would stop. You need thresholds. You know, for heaven's sakes, there's thresholds, there's uh, maximum residue levels in codex for arsenic in food. We need thresholds for in within when it comes to um, other things when we're talk, talking about grain, and in particular when it comes to GM, and in particular when we come to organic. So just a couple of things on the challenges. You could take the European approach and absolutely put enormous amount of security around it, um, and obviously don't go anywhere. Um, and I'll just give you a quick example, and I'm mindful of time here. A uh, shipment that of soybeans, uh, conventionally bred soybeans, that went into Rotterdam a couple of years ago. Uh, they detected trace amounts like a 0 .000 whatever 1% of a GM corn event in that shipment. They went down, they went right through the ship, they tried to find the kernels of uh, corn, they couldn't find any. There must be some broken kernels here, they couldn't find anybody. Somebody took a swab on the side of the bulkhead and found some corn dust. That shipment was rejected. So, when you're looking at, uh, and this comes back to the need for countries to adopt low-level presence policies, um, if you want to have a percent of GM um, at around about, you know, two, three, four, five percent, you will have a certain cost. If you want to have a percent of GM that is lower, the cost goes up, and then likewise, if you want to go, you know, down to almost zero, the cost will be significantly higher because what you'll be doing is taking companies out of the equation. And you saw that really well, and I could put up another example of uh, corn going into China last year, uh, but you see uh, that's just uh, with uh, corn gluten feed going into uh, Europe, uh, just following um, uh, some issues with the European attitude, which is a zero tolerance to unapproved events in, uh, in Europe. So the other thing that I really do want to stress is, uh, and probably hasn't come out all that well, well, is the product launch stewardship policy that's put in place, been put in place by uh, a number of, uh, well, by, by CropLife members and technology providers, and it's absolutely critical. The, the product launch stewardship is absolutely critical for the global grain trading grain, and a major component of that is uh, for technology providers to obtain uh, approval in all the major markets, and I emphasise here, with a functioning regulatory system before commercial release. Um, and that particular policy and the trade certainly supports the technology providers in putting together that product launch stewardship policy. So a couple of the challenges, we're certainly getting rapid growth um, we're, we're in uh, the amount of GM grain that's being traded internationally. Uh, but we've also got the challenges. Uh, we have to have regulatory alignment uh, where, where countries, uh, where, where the technology providers are putting forward their data packages uh, and some countries are approving those packages in a fairly expeditious manner and other countries are taking or, you know, uh, a long time. Um, and that causes, you know, just to, to use a bit of jargon, you know, it's asynchronous approvals. That creates a lot of concern by the trade, by the grain trade. We need to see low-level presence policies uh, around the world and the global low-level uh, initiative that was uh, initiated by Canada a couple of years ago uh, is to be applauded uh, and to be supported. Um, Product uh, jurisdictions and labeling, labeling is an issue, and we've mentioned the product launch stewardship. Um, but one of the biggest thing is exporting countries. We are in seeing increasing amount of GM grain. However, where there is a zero tolerance, that does concern, make a real concern for um, uh, grain trade. Uh, and as I was saying, one of two things happens where there is a zero policy zero tolerance policy, uh, organisations will either build a risk premium into the price that they or, you know, what they are prepared to, ch what will charge, or they will just step out of that market. Either way, the, the prices of that commodity will increase, uh, as has been seen in, e in the EU with uh, the cost of uh, feeds, particularly uh, gr feed grains into the dairy and uh, livestock sector. So. 
choice and coexistence, and I think we've moved along. Um, and uh, I'd really like to think, uh, as a, on a global basis, that we do start adopting the science, uh, backing our scientists, and also backing our regulatory uh, processes, uh, um, uh, approval processes. So just a couple of things. Agriculture happens in nature, so there's going to be diversity right across. Uh, there's going to, there is going to be variation. You cannot, it's not, uh, you know, um, everything is going to be exactly the same. There's going to be variation. So you have to be able to put in place standards that, uh, you know, that uh, react to that. Uh, co coexistence is about uh, production of conventional, organic, IP, identity preserved, GM crops consistent with supply chain preferences. So it's, it's not a, just about the production. You have to have the coexistence in the supply chain. You have to have ex coexistence right through um, the, um, from, uh, from farm all the way to the final user of that grain um, and being able for the final user of the grain to be receiving a product that they uh, have um, uh, documented in their contract. There needs to be thresholds. And I think uh, we've sort of, you know, f um, and something I don't think it came out and has come out in this session this afternoon. But uh, Australia organic standards have a zero threshold to GM. There has to be a tolerance in there. There was that court case that was mentioned a while ago, which was just a disastrous court case for the people involved, uh, both uh, at a uh, um, uh, personal level, uh, but also at a financial level. And it could have been alleviated if the organic standards had a low threshold. There needs to be, uh, and uh, we are seeing this, and uh, the presentation just previously from uh, uh, the Global Alliance, we are seeing organisations right across the supply chain talking to each other to ensure that, uh, that we can put this together. And what we did in Australia when we introduced uh, GM Canola, and so that was back in 2007, we put in place a market choice approach. And the market choice approach was just about giving farmers the opportunity, the choice, and consumers the ability, uh, the choice of what they wanted. So farmers having the choice of whether they want to do, use GM or not, and likewise with the consumers. The uptake of it has been fairly slow. The uptake of GM canola was not as quick as the uptake of, say, uh, GM cotton in Australia, where we got to 95% or 98% of market share within 10 years, uh, or GM canola in Canada, where, we got, where the Canadians got to 95%. Uh, we're only at about 15%, but that is not based on anything other than the economics of the GM, um, uh, the cost of the GM grain. It has, uh, and as, as I'll just sort of show, show in a minute. So the, um, so we wanted to put in place something that gave everybody lots of confidence, uh, the producers, the government, the regulatory authorities, etc. Uh, and we also wanted to make sure that we were able to maintain our existing markets, whether those were markets in Australia or markets overseas, given that uh, the, about two-thirds of our canola goes into markets, and in particular into, uh, uh, into uh, the EU. Um, we have to have the right systems and protocols for a variety of customer needs, uh, and hence the market choice policy. And the market choice policy was a very, very detailed document, uh, and uh, just for your information, we're about to update this document to include any GM grain that will be coming on to, the, to, to, to be approved. And so what you have is for GM grain, we have uh, the numbers up the top there, CS, uh, CS, or CSO, or CSO1 and CSO1A. One is uh, uh, non-GM and the other is uh, uh, just uh, everything else. In other words, GM, it might contain some non-GM, but there's a specific uh, set of and uh, trading standards for grain that, grain that is determined as non-GM. And that has worked extremely well. We did a review uh, after uh, a couple of years uh, right around Australia uh, with farmers as to you know, what they thought of it uh, and the, the impacts. So it was a quantitative um, as to uh, the on-farm impacts and differences between GM and non-GM with, uh, with farmers. And then it was also qualitative. So this was more about attitudes and perceptions. Um, and we're, just, we're not talking consumers here, we're just talking about the farmers. Uh, and this particular one, 
there was, uh, in, in total, uh, in Western Australia, 1,300, and in, in the eastern states, New South Wales and Victoria, where canola is grown, also 1,300 uh, farmers were involved. So it was quite a significant uh, number and over a number of years. So what were the major things that came out of it? Um, certainly, uh, in terms of um, coexistence concerns were not uh, evident uh, with uh, GM canola growers, um, and so that certainly was uh, very, very dominant. Um, there was, and I'm having a bit of trouble reading those numbers down there. Just excuse me for a minute, I'll get you in front of me. But I don't need glasses. I'm still in self-denial. So we've got uh, 70 to 95 percent of GM can uh, canola growers also grew non-GM, so they're very, very happy growing GM or non-GM. Um, and 88% uh, of GM canola growers did not receive any complaints. Um, so they, they did it, nothing was said. There was good uh, communication with neighbours, etc. The majority of the complaints came from people outside the farming sector. Um, so it wasn't as though there was farmers uh, complaining with each other uh, or agronomists or whatever. The farming sector saw this as a good initiative and got behind it. 10% uh, of non-GM non growers had neighbouring GM crops and 28% had GM crops in the district. Um, and this is the really interesting one, 94% of non-GM grow, uh, canola growers said that GM canola had no impact on their farming operation. 94% of non-GM canola growers said that GM canola had no impact on their farming operation. The introduction of GM canola into Australia and the, you know, the development of coexistence and, uh, uh, and the appropriate protocols has been an outstanding success. So, a couple of uh, sort of points to finish with. Um, certainly, it, it has impacted the supply chain, um, and I think uh, not just the supply chain, I think on-farm practices and the supply chain is better for the introduction of GM canola in terms of protocols, processes, uh, and uh, um, uh, traceability, etc. Um, it's given up, uh, the introduction has also led to uh, given uh, other opportunities such as uh, high oleic uh, oils and customer regulatory requirements, uh, i.e. the EU sustainability uh, process. And what it's been able to do is it's certainly given us uh, the approaches delivered and to the supply of non-GM and oil and mill when demanded. There hasn't been any issues whatsoever in being able to supply the non-GM market. And I think that's absolutely critical. So people had the choice. Supply chain responsible for managing and assuring non-GM uh, has been uh, uh, well documented and uh, we have the declarations, the testing protocols, the segregations in place. And consumers are influenced, once again, they're influenced by a number of things in relation to GM and non-GM uh, and, and, and there's just some of them. So I suppose in, in some respects you could look at it and say, you know, Australia, a any exporting country, uh, when you look at it, you know, they export wheat, they export barley, they export canola, sorghum, whatever it may be, you have the standards in place, you have the thresholds in place, and it's exactly the same, and I'm not trying to downplay it, but it's exactly the same for GM canola or conventionally bred canola. It's exactly, the, you know, you have the trading standards, you have the supply chain, you have the protocols, you are able to supply if a market does require GM. If it doesn't require GM, we can supply that as well. But you just need to have those processes in place and a threshold. Absolutely critical thresholds uh, to be in place. Concluding, it's de delivered a range of benefits uh, for canola growers and as I was saying, not just the growers but the whole supply chain is better for it. It's been slower than, ex than expected, the uptake, um, but that has uh, um, not been as a result of uh, coexistence issues uh, or GM. It's just the economics of, you know, buying GM corn, uh, uh, sorry, buying GM canola seed as against conventional, conventionally bred seed, uh, and, uh, and uh, it, so it hasn't been a yield thing, it's just the, uh, the economics of it. 
Uh, the market choice approach um, has enabled Australian industry to continue to access all the markets that we previously had. Uh, and we're still putting uh, uh, substantial quantities of non-GM uh, canola into, uh, into, the, into Europe. And that has to be, if you can get product into Europe, you're doing extremely well. Uh, uh, globally, uh, biotech crops have been the, the fastest uh, adopted crop technology in recent times. We need to put the policies in place to be able to, to continue this. Um, and we need continued growth in production and trade of grains and oil seeds to meet uh, the demand for food. And I sort of touched on that earlier in terms of uh, uh, almost a social responsibility. And I suppose if I could put it to it uh, at a government level, whether we have the political appetite to sort of start to really get behind uh, the science, the approval processes uh, to, to take this technology to the world, uh, not just, uh, uh, and you know, if I can just go back to, you know, to, to, to my country, uh, we have, uh, uh, the CSIRO have funded uh, scientists, uh, Australian uh, uh, research uh, uh, scientists, um, and we would be amongst, and I don't think I'm bragging here overly, <laughs> probably a bit, but uh, I'd say that we have some of the best scientists in the world in relation to drought tolerance and wheat, yet that technology isn't going anywhere, and I don't think that's right. Uh, we have very, very good regulatory processes, uh, as a nation, and I'm a bit embarrassed that the Australia, there's nobody from Australia here, uh, but as a nation, we should be really stepping up and putting our political weight behind uh, the technology, and not just GM, but all plant, plant breeding technologies that are coming on, coming forward. Um, so we need the regulatory approaches, and we've talked about that. Um, zero thresholds, we've talked about that, but I will just sit on it just again. You cannot have zero thresholds. Zero threshold stops trade. And I just say that again, zero threshold stops trade. And there's only one thing that happens when trade stops and, you, and you, have, you don't have as many suppliers into a market, and that is prices increase. Uh, there is so, and which comes into compliance risk and supply chain distortions, key considerations for the grain trade. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Jeff Honey of uh, Australia Grain Trade. Uh, let me also thank you for the uh, exhaustiveness and the candidness with which we have uh, made your presentation. Uh, may I now please uh, open the floor uh, for further contributions or uh, comments on this very important presentation, which is an actual experience from the trading sector. Floor is open. Is there just one? <laughs> okay. Okay. Maybe you guys are hungry. <laughs> okay. Uh, this this time slot or forum, however, is not the only time that we can have uh, a conversation with our resource speaker. He's not going to Australia within the day, coming back to Australia within the day. But uh, uh, last call for any further contributions or interventions. Uh, let me just say, though, that uh, maybe it might uh, spur some uh, participation from, from some members. That uh, The important thing that I find uh, very important here is that when we talk about coexistence, it's usually a, uh, a particular focus on the production side. But I think what is a very good take home here is that uh, the coexistence issue is up to the to the trading side, the trading and distribution side, and that I think is a proper 
uh, delineation and definition of uh, uh, the coexistence uh, issue insofar as uh, it is a policy issue for uh, member economies of APEC, particularly those that are important uh, grain exporters as well as grain importing uh, member economies. Anything further on this? Actually, Mr. Chairman, can I just make one final comment? Please. Um, it was one of the things that came out of the presentations earlier on today. And when people think about the grain trade, they think about the biggest grain trading companies in the world. Um, and it's true. Um, they, they move a lot of grain. Uh, but there's also, and once again, I'll just go back to an Australian perspective. Um, Vietnam is one of our major markets, but the majority of grain that goes into Vietnam is in containers. Uh, and that is being exported by family, a lot of them are family businesses, uh, exporting to family businesses or small flour mills in Vietnam. Um, so the issue of trading grain, please don't just think about it as uh, big companies doing it. There's a lot of uh, smaller entities right across the spectrum and also on the importing side as well. And I think that's, that's an important, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, an important aspect. Thanks. Thank you very much. Again, we thank uh, uh, Mr. Geoff Honey for this uh, presentation. Thank you very much, sir, and thank you for taking the time to be with us and make this presentation. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, by our program, I have to make a wrap up. Uh, wow, this is a very long wrap up. Let me do it this way. Uh, <laughs> we had a closed session in the morning where we were able to thresh out uh, internal issues, more particularly on the terms of reference of the high-level policy dialogue on agricultural biotechnology in much the same way that our uh, colleagues from the private sector in a parallel meeting of a private sector initiated activity and dialogue uh, within this same venue, we also had our own very important internal discussions and presentation from our colleagues in Canada on LLP. I think that was uh, that closed session was very productive. And then we opened the session where we were able to, uh, we were graced by the presence of our uh, guests from the private sector, as well as our uh, resource, guest resource persons from uh, our private sector partners as well. And we benefited from uh, a host of presentations uh, which are essentially uh, all informative in nature. First is an overview of the status and impact of crop biotech adaptation in the Asia Pacific. Uh, although of course you regularly, I'm sure you regularly have these updates from ISIA, uh, from Clive Jane's regular reports on uh, biotech, the status of biotech adaptation all around the world. And those, those graphs and those figures have been regularly updated and we just benefited from a uh, regular update from Dr. Halos, including uh, localized impacts, uh, more particularly the, the Philippine experience on uh, the, not only the impacts on farmers, but uh, impacts on the environment and biodiversity, which were very, uh, very helpful in terms of being able to have a more comprehensive appreciation on agricultural biotechnology. We also uh, had uh, reports on activities that are actually activities on the run up to this meeting. The first one was reported to us uh, a report on uh, 
the outcomes of the workshop on fostering the benefits of innovation and plant breeding in science communication. This was uh, ably reported to us by Dr. Randy Hautea of ISEA. And uh, it's very, these, the, the action points that have been raised here, more particularly on the importance of uh, communication. Of course, they have a, they have emphasized a, what do you call this, uh, pipe dream on harmonization, which is an, uh, a quest uh, among our uh, regulators that is a, uh, that is a, an objective that's probably uh, a, a good, good one to shoot for. Uh, but all efforts of, I'm sure, of all our, uh, of all economists towards being able to, for regulatory systems to be able to communicate, to be more facilitative of trade, is a very important message that has been uh, com uh, conveyed to us by the report of Dr. Hautea. Also, we had a, an open fresh report by Sani Tababa on the private sector initiated activity where they, they were able to report to us their discussions on uh, the model policy on low-level presence as presented uh, in that meeting. Also on um, GM and organic farming coexistence, which of course more, uh, more properly reported to us in much more detail to this particular meeting by uh, Mr. Geoff Honey of Grain, Grain Trade Australia. And of course, a, uh, that, that meeting also reported uh, the presentation of uh, the presentation on BT eggplant and uh, a submission uh, from uh, our stakeholders in the Philippine uh, eggplant industry uh, on a uh, a submission of a petition for support and expression uh, a detailing of their expression of support for the commercialization of this particular technology before the Department of Agriculture. And it was yours truly who was, again, the recipient of this particular petition, which I had reported to them. I'm only happy to, uh, to receive instead of a uh, petition saying otherwise, that's probably going to create a lot more headaches for me as a bureaucrat of the department. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, of course, uh, our last presentation was a, uh, I think, a very interesting presentation on the actual experience of the of Grain Trade Australia, which I suppose is also a represents the experience of the grain trading sector in in Australia, an important uh, an important uh, member economy of APEC, and from whose experience we. Uh, are likely to benefit from their uh, experience on policy and how this is perceived uh, by the private sector, in this case, the, uh, the grain trading sector of Australia. Uh, I also find it significant that uh, Mr. Honey has emphasized that it is not just big, uh, big grain trading agents or enterprises that uh, are uh, the subject of uh, these issues or these regulatory issues uh, that will become much more prominent as we go on uh, as technology advances and as regulatory systems try to cope up with technological developments that tend to spiral that even the small family, uh, family enterprises are going to have to deal with these particular uh, issues in trade. Uh, let me also uh, let me also try to recall what our SOM Vice Chair has reminded us on one of the important thrusts of uh, the APEC meetings in the Philippines for this year is a particular, uh, particular emphasis well on a big sector in many, in many APEC economies, the, the micro sector, the micro enterprises. That's why they call them MISMIS. So it's a micro, small, medium uh, enterprises. Uh, I'm not sure whether I like the term miss-miss because you tend to miss it. 
uh, sometimes, but here what probably has been missing in terms of how we deal with the uh, uh, entrepreneurship and the, the entrepreneurial sector in our trading sector is finally complete. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is my wrap up on my, on my own responsibility as chair of this meeting. But I'm very sure that our colleague from Japan who will provide us with a, another wrap up of day one will have a better and more time to prepare to remind us about what transpired today that will be, that we need to be able to connect for our meeting tomorrow. So today we concentrated on the plant kingdom. Tomorrow is uh, hopefully, uh, I think is something uh, a little bit new to our discussions because we were going to move into certain uh, not very much known territory on animal biotechnology. Uh, I think this is going to be at the very least, very interesting and informative to all of us, uh, particularly colleagues in the APEC economies who are in the area of uh, policy and then uh, particularly regulatory policy. With that, ladies and gentlemen, before I end, uh, I, would, I would be open to any further contributions in so far as our activities for today are concerned so that we uh, I hope you are not yet hungry because we're going to have a photo session after this and I want everybody to be smiling their best when we face those multiple number of cameras given the digital democracy that has been introduced into the photography business. Floor is open. Okay, it's either uh, you're very tired and you're tired of the chair or you're entirely satisfied with the way we have conducted the meeting. And again, let, let us uh, express our appreciation to our uh, resource persons who were able to add uh, a lot, lot more substantially to the knowledge that we have today as policy makers. Okay, uh, we have uh, announcements, additional announcement from uh, Ms. Siena. Jaja, please. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Allow me to reprise the announcements we did earlier. Immediately after the adjournment of the session is a photo shoot at Hall 1. First batch for the photo shoot are the economy delegates, and the second batch will be for everyone. And with your indulgence, may we request all of you to assemble at the lobby thereafter for the APEC welcome reception, which will be held at Casa Real de Iloilo, courtesy of the Provincial Governor of Iloilo City, the Honorable Arthur Defensor Sr. Cocktails is to be served at the courtyard at 6.30 p.m., followed by a dinner at 7 p.m. at the ceremonial hall. Shuttle service will be provided to all delegates. The liaison officers will be available to provide assistance. Thank you very much, and have a very pleasant evening.